BBL's Gunners Collective TV. Back at it, you already know. Like a motherfucking smack addict. Fire, fire, fire. In a minute, we'll start a direct fashion, man. We're going to get straight to the content of the day. But before we do, let's hit that like and subscribe button. Put your notification bell on all so that way you're directed in the direction of the dope content that I am kicking. Sauce. Yeah, I look, I look like a pirate. Utterly Willie Stardrill, right? And you already know what it is. So I wanted to talk about something that happened in the past, man. Um, You know, this is kind of to dispel the rumors that, you know, the brothers and the Norteños always work hand in hand. Sometimes there's drama, man. You know, in prison, when you get incarcerated behind them walls, you have to understand that if you join a group or you're part of an organization or a group, that's what it is, man. People might consider other people allies or taitas or camaradas or homies, um, but it's just you and yours. And really, it's just you. You know, um, you can't trust anyone. It's a cutthroat business. At any given time, the yard can change. It can flip on you. It can switch up. Those that were once your friends become your foes. That's just part of life, man. We have that in life. People that are your friends later on become your enemies. And those are probably some of the worst enemies you can have. And that's because they know you. They know the ins and outs. They know your get down. It's kind of like the Packers and the 49ers. See, them coaches know each other. You know, so they know how to work around the bullshit. They know your flaws. They know your, your uh, strong points. It's the same thing in life and in prison, man. Everybody knows everybody. So when you're enclosed in a small space, small area, everybody's in everybody's business. Regardless if they're trying to be that, it just is what it is. You can't run in prison. There's nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. I mean, you could roll it up, go to the program office, tell them I'm cool. You know what I mean? I'm going to fold up tent and whatever. Um, and there's going to be motherfuckers trying to book you on the way to wherever you're going. So now look, 2007, Lassen Yard, uh, Susanville Prison. And let me tell you the makeup of Susanville Prison. It's way out in the middle of butt fuck Egypt, out of nowhere, right? Uh, close to high desert. Um, it's a place nobody wants to go. It's kind of like the end of the road. Those three, there's three end of the road places that you go to in prison in California. Susanville, High Desert, Pelican Bay. These places are far. It doesn't matter if, even if you're from Northern California. It's far from that, right? It's just far. I can only understand or imagine guys from Southern California being stuck there. They're so far from home. And it's desolate. It's desert. It's nothing. It's fucking yellow grass. It's snow in the winter. Ice. Um, it's just a place meant to fucking test the abilities of your manhood, right? They're going to test and see how strong you really are. Places like this are meant to break people. Places like Susanville, High Desert, Pelican Bay, they're meant to fucking twist your mind. They're going to see where your head's at. Only the strong survive. You hear that old thing? That's the truth, right? So this was a place where not everybody was happy to be there, but it is what it is. Prison is prison. You have to go with the flow. You have to, you know, go with the rhythm. So anyways, I remember me, myself, getting to Susanville. I was on alert, kind of like, damn, man, I never thought I was going to end up here. You know, I was trying to stay in the Central Valley, the Jamestown area, Tracy, you know, even Pleasant Valley, Solid Dad, Salinas Valley, anywhere close to home so I can get a visita, so I can be close to knock a bitch, man. She'd come visit me and send me fucking, you know, uh, money on my books. But way up here, you feel like you're isolated from everybody. So I get to the yard and I recall that particular yard, man, after I went straight to the hole, because what they did was they had all the Norteños in administrative segregation pending the yard flip. They were flipping the yard at the time. I've told the story before. There was um, it was a 50-50 yard. They were flipping it and to become an active Norteño yard. So we were all placed in the oil. Um, and I remember, you know, there was a lot of we lost flying. We were talking amongst our own what we were going to do, how we were going to establish. There was someone that was back there who ended up become being a degenerate the whole time that was actually uh, pushing the flow of that yard. Um, we come to find out later that he was no good, but it was too little, too late for my career. Anyways, so we're back there and we get to the main line. Things are flipped. Everyone's going through their process. You know, we're figuring out what buildings are what, who's who, where's where, all the homies. Um, not only do we have to worry about the Southsiders, the Southerners, who were very, very respectful. That's one thing I could say there about Susanville that I never had any type of animosity or pleito with the Southsider. They were always righteous, real. Um, and that's one thing I could say that, that a lot of that right there, seeing that particular spot changed a lot of my mentality. I was already good for the Raza. I was already like, man, tired of the, you know, the, the inner game banging with my own people or fighting with Southsiders. But this right here showed me a whole new way. You know, they were very cool. So we get there. We don't have Mac reps. That's one thing Northenders don't do is conform to Mac reps. Everyone else does, right? 
Norteños thought that it, it put a target on the homeboy's back for being a mouthpiece, and there was nobody. We're not going to put a leader on Front Street at all, and then you're not going to let just someone that's not educated in the season speak for you. You know, so it just wasn't going to happen. You weren't going to fraternize with the canine. That's one thing Norteños don't do is have some build some type of camaraderie or relationship with a canine, being a cop or any administration. It just doesn't happen. Norteños consider themselves the elite, the Navy SEALs of prison. So they're not going to conform to anything administration has going on. So I remember we were on lockdown and there was a lot of brothers, man, that used to do our bidding for us. They used to look out for us. And a lot of the brothers that did look out for us were the NCs, the Northern Crips. And I don't know how that came into play if the homies, the powers that may be um, that were on a different block from the block we were on uh, made it that way or worked out a situation where it's like, hey, can you help us, you know, to facilitate our messages from building a building? Because uh, again, we were not going out there to the yard. We were not, uh, we were all in a lockdown. That means everybody else used to come out to the day room. Everyone else go program their work, yard. We ate inside ourselves. Um, we came out cell by cell to go shower. I mean, when everyone else was locked down, it was fucked up. You know, a lot of us just burnt bat did and just worked out and educated our minds all we could do. And when we had to wait until we got the green light and the homeboy said, okay, now we can go out to the yard, you know, and then the administration signed off on it and boom. So it took a while. Um, I remember we were on lockdown for about a month and a half to two months. Eventually we did come to the yard and then shit played out how it played out. But in that meantime, in between time, here's knowledge you can't get in college. The brothers were looking out for the Norteños, no doubt about it. And I've been to a lot of different prisons, man, where the brothers, man, facilitated messages, handed off weapon stock, man, um, looked out. You know, they'd be like, hey, your homie said, what's up? Or a simple like, hey, what's up? And you just knew, Southsiders knew, everybody knew that we were working hand in hand. Was there an alliance? Were we going to kill each other together and fucking a pack written in stone that we we're going to, you know what I mean, ride like that? No. But we were in a facility in a prison that was predominantly Southern and white. And when I say white... It's always had the nickname Susanville as being the White House or Susie's house. Um, there was a gang of skinheads on that yard. Okay, a gang of them. More SoCal skinheads than NorCal skinheads, but there was a lot. There was a lot of woods. So it was white. You know, it was white as snow out there, man. The woods were programming, brother. Wes Watson wasn't there, though. No, 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 he wasn't there. He was in some level four dorm in Tehachapi or something, you know, according to him. Hoping everything inside. He had all the good black and the good white, right? That's what he was doing. But as far as the real woods... The motherfuckers that were there were some serious individuals, serious business. They had all the good hollis. They had all the fucking game, you know, with, with them and the Southerners who actually functioned on the same side of the yard. And again, there wasn't an alliance. There wasn't an alliance between them, but there was an understanding and respect. We were very outnumbered. There was probably about, I'd say at that time, maybe 60, 60 of us in that yard. And there was probably a couple hundred Southsiders and a couple hundred whites and then maybe 150 blacks or whatever, you know, give or take, paisas, others. Um, put it like this. We were the minority for real, though. Right. And that's just it. Us and the paisas and, and, and the, uh, of course, the paisas ran with the South and uh, the others, man, they were not obsolete. They were with the wiggle, but there wasn't very many of them. And no one fucked with them anyways. They had their own little program. So anyways, I remember there was this one particular black dude. He was from Tulare County, man. Good ass crip. You know, he used to come as a light-skinned cat, little young cat. Almost could pass off his white if you didn't know, right? Um, he used to come to the cell all the time, facilitate messages. He had a good-ass job as a groundskeeper, so he could actually go outside the buildings. So, of course, he would come through, shoot wheelies. Um, Everything was going good for a while. Of course, we, back, we went back to the main line, back out to that yard. And we still worked hand-in-hand -hand with the brothers on a lot of situations. We'd go to the same side of the day room, chop it up, conversate, play uh dominoes together, spades together, whatever, man. It was cool. I noticed that a lot of the black dudes that were there, they were on point. They were on alert. They felt the same way we felt, that they were outnumbered, man. And, you know, they were happy to have some sort of an ally, some sort of a uh, group that if something did kick off, man, and it became like that, it could become like that. But again, people fucking are doing their own thing. Just because you guys conversate or you laugh or you smile and you tell war stories and you play dominoes together, boom, both the doors, just that quick, something temperamental could set it off. Because you have a lot of individuals that are mad for no other reason than fuck, they're stuck way out in the middle of fucking Pakistan. You know what I'm saying, Capone? That's just how it is. So, this particular shit set off all behind a radio. Okay, let me tell you about radios in prison. Boom boxes, a radio. Um, there, if you got them, a lot of the guys that have been doing time have been down for 10 plus years back in them days. 
they all had their little super radio, right? They called them a super, super two, super three, right? Some people had the little black fucking old school radio. Some people had the boom box. Everybody wanted a boom box. So if someone paroled that had a boom box, sometimes he had a couple of them. He would leave one to his homeboys and there would always be one floating around or on sale on the tier. If we didn't have, we had one in our cell, man. Luckily, my home, my homeboy, my cellie had just come from high desert. Um, so he brought his with them. He was able to bring it in. But there was a lot of people that did it, right? And you need one of those. In prison, you need your TV and you definitely need your boom box. Your boom box, you slap your little CD in there because you're able to buy CDs, get them through fucking, um, through packages, right? And you work out and there's a lot of people that trade CDs or let you borrow CDs. I remember me and my cellie, every time we used to work out, um, Beast from Sakura, right? We used to borrow CDs from the Southsiders that were next door. One of them was from Sangra, and I forget where the other one was from. Um, but they were the who's who of the fucking Southsiders in that facility. They were the ones. They they looked like the ones, and they were the ones, right? And they were cool as fuck. Some of the coolest dudes I ever met. They bang on the wall. Hey, hey, I said, what's up, bro? Hey, let us borrow that fucking Lincoln Park. We'll let you borrow this young Jeezy. And we'd switch off, and we'd be working out. We could hear them working out. It was just rasa, man. And just that little bit of... You know, uh, 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 love right there. You know, even in wartime or peacetime, it doesn't matter. It makes you feel a certain way. Like, damn, man, what, it was, what I'm doing is really cool. You know what I mean? Hating on these guys or vice versa because they're really fucking cool ass dudes. So anyways, we do our thing. Um, but again, boom boxes are like a main commodity there. Everybody wants them. You know, there's a lot of people that don't have the privilege of having them. And they're just looking down here and we're not going to take it. Coming from a white guy, sell hella loud. So anyways, um, or there are some facilities that will take out your speakers and you have to use headphones and that's fucked up. Now you got to pace back and forth with some big old CL20s on and bust down, man. And that, that's hard to do, especially when you're really getting it and it gets all slippery and sweaty in there. You can rip your cord and I've done it all, man. So anyways, um, one of the homeboys, he was a younger homeboy at the time from Sakura, righteous ass homeboy, right? Bigger dude uh, was in the building that we were in, which was building three, which we called the Pentagon at that time. The reason we called the Pentagon is that was where the majority of the homeboys that had juice or the majority of the homeboys that were about about it, like a motherfucking No Limit soldier, were, right? On every side, the whites, all their shot callers, basically, their Yaveros, um, the guys who held the keys were on that yard, uh, were in that building. So were the Southsiders, like I said, they were my neighbors. A lot of the Norteños um, that had been somewhere and were seasoned were in that building. Now, there was another building where there was a lot too. But our building was known as the Pentagon because the who's who of who the fuck are they are right there. And the same thing went for the brothers, man. The Crip shot caller was there, the NC as well as the LA Crips. It is two different cars, but they do come together. Now, one thing about the, I remember that there was not a lot of bloods at that time. Wasn't a lot of bloods, man. It was mostly LA Crips, um, some Kumis and NCs. There was a few NCs, right? Um, Northern Crips are always the smallest cars, not very many of them. So anyways... Um, there was a fuck, the homie fucking had a boom box. He had bought a boom box off the tier. He had, he had money. How? I don't know, man, but he was the type of homeboy that went full draw canteen every time. Packages fat, looking out for the homeboys with packages. If you were his celly, you, you had it going on. Cadillac, right? You were going to eat good. Um, and he looked out. He always brought out comida for all the homeboys in the day room. Make sure that you had fucking cosmetics. It was just a good, righteous homie. Hey, he was what a Norteño was supposed to be. Someone who looked out for his gente and his people. Never threw it in your face like, I'm balling, you're not. You know, he would always ask, hey, do you need anything? He would buy the homeboys chanclas off canteen. He would make sure that the homeboys had, you know, good ropa because he always had the good shit. He was buying it. He was just the money man there. Um, he had it like that. You know, some homeboys do. Some homeboys like myself didn't have too much. You know, didn't have familia looking out for him. And it wasn't because people hated me or I was an asshole. It was because I just, some of our families are fucking barely making it, right? So I knew better than to ask. Um, but he definitely looked out for a lot of homies. So he had a lot of interaction with the blacks because he liked to smoke Yes God, the brothers smoked weed. So there was always business going, you know, everybody was always trying to run out to that yard, find the, so the dope man, the man with the sack, especially the brothers, you know, they liked their weed. So they'd always run to the yard. Either they were facilitating it or someone else was facilitating it. But by what they had, we were able to do business with the brothers, right? So the homeboy could get weed from the blacks, couldn't get it from the whites or the South Siders, but it's just fucking politics, right? It's the way prison is. It's crazy. That same weed that came out of that white guy's asshole, you can't touch it. But if it goes into a brother's hands, then I can take it from him. Go figure, right? The politics. Um, so anyways, he built this relationship with this NC, that same NC from Tulare County that was fucking uh, with, the, with the activities, the shenanigans, right? 
the one that was doing all, you know, showed love for us. So he had built like a stronger relationship with the North Daniels. He was cool. And so the homeboy had came up on this beat up boom box, but that black dude happened to have a celly that they could fix boom boxes. That's what they did, right? So I guess fucking, uh, you know, they worked out some type of deal where the homeboy was like, hey, look, I'm going I'm to be coming up on a sack this week. I'm going to break you off so much of this sack if you can fix my boom box. They worked it out between them and the brothers was like, hell yeah, we're going to get smoked out. Says we're going to be sipping on some gin and juice and kick back in our cell. So anyways, about a week, week and a half passes. They're working on the boom box. You know what I mean? They already went over the time limit. So the homeboy smokes or gets rid of all the shit, right? But again, the homeboy has a gang of commissary in his cell. He's going full. Everyone knows he has money. You know, he can make money happen and get, go on your books quick. He just had it like that. So anyway, the brother comes to his cell with the boom box and is like, hey, bro, um, I'm done. You know what I'm saying? Make it like a high, make a high knee help. Where am I at? Guard, right? And the homie's like, hey, bro, you know, shit changes. You know, we don't got that shit no more. It's gone, bro. But you can either wait till I get some more or I can pay you in store. Either way, bro, I got you. You know what I mean? I ain't trying to burn you or nothing like that. And the brother was upset. He was highly upset. He was like, nah, bro, you gave me your word. This is what it was going to be. You know, he probably told his celly and his homies, man, I got a sack coming. Don't even trip, bro. I'm in that motherfucker like a mad scientist trying to make this motherfucking uh, Super 3 work. I got it, right? Um, and it just didn't work out, man. So they started to have words. And one thing you can't have in prison is words in public. Okay, you can write it down on paper. You can pull someone to the side and get at them, homes. But even then, everyone's going to be all up in your masa, and your tamale. Everyone's going to be looking. Damn, ooh, he pulled him to the side. What's going to happen? It's a three yard. So, you know, on three and four yards, there's not going to be no fist. No one's going to take flight. You know, I mean, the brothers will. They'll sock you up, right? But any Mexican is going to pull out a pedazo and get to whack you. So, these guys are having fun on the top tier. Everyone's kind of looking like, oh, shit, you know. Um, that ain't right. The Norteños and the brothers, that shit usually doesn't happen, right? That's what they say, that they're allies. Um, it's not the truth. Let me dispel that rumor right here. So the brothers feel some type of way. So he's like, okay, whatever. You're going to burn me? Take your fucking little stereo and, and whatever. And the homie's like, nah, it ain't like that, bro. You, you got the game fucked up. But the homie's feeling uh, uh, like you ain't going to just clown on me or talk shit to me. So there's words. So it gets to the point where it gets almost physical, right? Um, now there's funk. Now... It's quiet in that day room. You got to understand, we function on the same side of the day room, right? So now everybody's kind of looking at everybody like, what's going to happen? The brothers are plotting and scheming and planning over there because they feel like they got burnt. They feel like they got worked out of, you know, his his hard work. And the Norteños feel like, hey, bro, you know, fuck these vatos anyways, man. If they want to come at us sideways over, some, over a stupid ass radio, it ain't even that serious. But again, like I said, you know, many wars have been fought on them yards for less than shoes, Boom boxes, a fucking can of bugler, you know what I mean? A pedazo. You know, I've seen a fucking riot kick off because someone dug up someone else's pedazo. You know, if people have, if different groups are burying their shit on the yard and doing their thing, as a Norteño, it was up to us to identify where their fucking pedazos were. We were always watching. So if we see a Southsider dig one, we're going to try to dig it up, homie. You know what I mean? So that way when shit kicks off and they try to, they're digging like, it was here, right? Eh? No, it ain't there no more, eh? It's right here. You know what I mean? And that's how that was. Um, straight from their hand to the dirt, to our asshole, to our hand. You know, Wes knows the deal, the recipe. So that's how that was. So anyways, the blacks were feeling some type of way, man, and they moved on the Norteños. Straight up. And when it popped in one building, it popped in other buildings. And of course, it gravitated to the yard and it popped. And the Southerners just sat there and watched the fireworks, you know. And it became not just a Crip thing and a Norteño thing, but it actually became a black and a Norteño thing because... Susanville being so short with blacks and Norteños, of course the Norteños are all going to ride together. They're going to stick together. That's just the way it is. It ain't hood shit. It's all the homies together. And the brothers, man, you will have sometimes where the Crips get off or the Bloods get off or the Kumis get off, Jama, whoever they're going to get off, Muslims, non-affiliates. Um, but in this place, they all kind of stuck together. It wasn't too many blacks. You know what I'm saying? Um, and they got off, man, got off pretty vicious. And it was a war, man. It happened. It, it happened over a few weeks. So eventually they locked everybody down. But I'll tell you this, man, the brothers ain't, they didn't hesitate. They moved on the North Daniels quite viciously, man. And it was a back and forth thing. Now, at this time I was in the oil. Okay. I was in the oil. I was waiting to be transferred when all this shit happened. You know, I'm telling you a secondhand story, but I'm telling you pura, for reals, how it went down, right? Anyone that was there will tell you. And, um, they were bringing a lot of brothers, man, a lot of North Daniels into the hole. And, uh, you know, there was no love loss. You know, there was big plans to get out and keep it rocking. Eventually, man, I got shipped out and I'm sure it got worked out. 
You know, um, them wars don't last too long between Norteños and Blacks, but when they do get down, they get down. They go out. So a lot of people that believe, oh, no, Norteños are, they, they kick it with Blacks all the time. It's all love. It ain't always like that. You know, something as simple as a fucking radio got a whole bunch of people stabbed on the yard, got a whole bunch of people stretched out. And, and you know, and I'm sure fucking the South Siders and the Whites were like, oh, hell no, nah, right? That's how quick it could set off. Now, of course, it wasn't a racial thing. It was two groups. It was the blacks, basically, versus the Norteños. And, of course, the Sureños are not going to assist. But from what I heard from my homeboy, the Sureños did actually, the Southsiders actually did come up to the Norteños and ask them if they needed their assistance. That's one thing I've learned about Southsiders that I respect, man. They are all about the raza. Period. All about Chicanismo. All about, you know, the wiggle. And if they see any Latino, you know, uh, getting ridiculed, made fun of, even a paisa, um, they're not going to let another ethnicity or what people would call race. I, I think we're all one race, human race, right? But another ethnicity or culture, um, touch their people, North, South, none of that. You know what I mean? Um, now if it's wartime and they're against North Daniels and a black wants to jump in and jump on a North Daniel, cool, right? Whatever. More the merrier. You know what I mean? Ride that, ride that railroad. Um, LeVar Burton. But if it's fucking all about, um, a racial thing, they definitely will lay their arms down, man, and pick up other arms hand in hand with Norteños. I've seen it. You know, I've almost been a part of it. I told you in the Youth Authority, man, when the Vato from Calexico walked up to us and we were we were pretty shook. Not scared and shook up. Oh, he's going to get us, right? But we were shook. Like, what's this Vato doing walking up on us? You know what I mean? We got ready. Like, oh, shit. We took a stance. He was a big bottle, And he was like, hey, can I get at you guys? We're like, Simone. He was like, hey, these brothers are getting a little loud and too deep, homie. And one of them wants to fucking... What happened was we had two TVs in the day room. One was for movies and, and whatever, the uh, sports. You know, the other one was basically the Mexican TV. It never changed, homie. It was on Spanish all the time. The only time that fucking TV changed is if it was movie night, and then the movies would be on both sides of the TV. So you, if you uh, sat on that side of the day room, fuck you. You're asked out, right? You're watching Esmeralda. You're watching a novela. You're watching Levantate. You're watching fucking Caliente, which the brothers would say, hey, what is that show that you guys watch? Caliente? Boom. They throw that motherfucker on. It was Caliente and Soul Train on theirs, right? So I give up in that motherfucker rubbing like, damn, sure love me a Mexican, right? And that's how that was. But these vaultas got deep, man, and they started to, hey, why don't you put Soul Train on both TVs? You know what I'm saying? Bobby Brown's going to drop dope on, on stage. We're trying to see it. And, of course, the Southsiders, man, being the way they are, they were like, fuck that. You know what I mean? Leave that shit on fucking... The news. We want to see if the, a hurricane hit in fucking Matamoros. That's it. Um, and then there was going to be funk. And of course, it never materialized or happened. Um, and I'm glad it didn't because, man, I hate black and brown uh, division. I hate the bullshit, you know. Even that situation in Susanville, hearing about it and knowing what was going on behind the walls in the oil, you know, and hearing, you know, the stories back and forth. You know, a lot of brothers coming in the hole, a lot of Norteños. I was like, fuck, eh. This is not what... I signed up for it. This is not what it's supposed to be. I understand about get it on war. Anyone could get it in prison. It's just the way it is. You're going to stick to your people. Um, but it's an ugly situation when someone that you actually, you know, were cool with and, and gave a sopa to, and the next thing you know, you're having to stab them. It's just that it's just it works out like that. Anyways, with that being said, man, um, eventually over time, shit blows over and everyone does their thing. But yes, man, that is a, a situation. Facts, 100% where North Daniels and blacks got off with each other all over a fucking radio or all over a man's word. Either way, man, you can see it however you want to see it. There's going to be people that leave comments that like, we should have kept his word. <clears throat> you know, what you have today, you might not have tomorrow. So you're absolutely right. He should have kept his word. Um, but at the end of the day, them being close and cool, man, I'm sure they could have talked it out. I think, uh, uh, you know, it was just a heated argument and motherfuckers got put on the spot. With that being said, I hope that you move with a purpose. I hope you guys have a beautiful and a great blessed day. It's Saturday, man. Enjoy that Packers and that Niners game. I know I am. Um, kick back, relax with your familia, and enjoy life. With that being said, move with a purpose. Get everything that you want coming. But remember, the only way to do that is to struggle, strive hard for what you need and what you got, man. No one's going to give it to you. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Heavy's going to be the head that wears the crown. Hmm. I'm going to continue to strive, struggle, struggle, and strive for what I truly believe in. And that's the betterment of Black Brown, the woods, brother. Yes. The white man, right? Someone checked me the other day. And I'll, I'll take it, right? Why do you always say white boys? You don't ever say black boys, right? That's racist and derogatory. Call us white men. Orderly, white man. Bang, bang. The gun.